Hi, John. It's wonderful to have you here today. Nice to meet you over Zoom and, and be connected. Thank you yeah. for reaching out on Instagram. Definitely. I mean, isn't that the way everybody does it now? <laughs> Pretty much. It's like it's like the new way of saying hey. <laughs> yeah, it's a new way of saying hey. I've been a fan of yours from afar. Uh, you've been at the game for a long time. Uh, just to explain for those who might not be familiar, uh, you were born with a gift. Uh, a sixth sense, so to speak. Am I am I using the right terminology here? You are. Um, I like to I like to alleviate the word gift and kind of turn it into ability. And I feel like once I do that, it levels the playing field for everybody a little bit. So and I think it comes from like when I started doing this, I was 15. And anybody that I met at the age of 15 who was doing this were in their 40s, 50s and 60s. And they all made me feel like I was like way down here and they were way up here and they weren't. So to me, I think <laughs> the word gift makes it seem like I'm more special and I'm not. So I use the word ability, but yeah, I've been doing this for, for quite a while. And uh, not to make you go back into your entire bio, but when you were very young, like you said, you were 16. So you realized you had a special ability of being able to communicate with the other side. And when I say the other side, um, some people might call it heaven, uh, right. another plane. How, how right. would you explain that? So at the age of 15, I had a reading that put me on my path. I went to debunk a woman doing readings at my grandmother's house on Long Island. <laughs> that, changed, that changed my life in a very, very big, big way. Then taking my very skeptical mindset into the subject matter, learning about energy. For the first couple of years of doing this work, I really just talked about what was coming up in a person's life and what was happening around them. And then simultaneously, I started getting information from people in spirit, like the spirit world, right? Mm -hmm. So... I like to look at it as a, a different dimension. You can call it heaven. You can call it the hereafter. You can call it the afterlife. You can call it the spirit world, um, a different dimension. But it's basically once the consciousness of our soul leaves the vehicle, which is the physical body, it still stays connected to the family and friends that are here. Love doesn't die. So I'm able to connect with that and then help people recognize. So yeah, I started started young, um, just getting symbol, sy symbolic symbolic moments in regular readings that didn't make sense until the person I was reading would say, yeah, that's true, but that's my grandmother, but she's dead. Like, well, that's my dad, but he died 10 years ago. And I used to say, well, these are people who are once important in your life, and that's why I'm connecting with them to validate that I'm connecting with you, pay attention to what's coming up. And it was another medium who actually watched me do a reading, and she went, dude, she's like, no. She's like, you're actually making connections with people. Go with that. Do you, um, and this might be an elementary question for you, but do you see the being? Uh, I don't, I, I don't. So okay. early on, early on, Diana, I did. Early on, what would happen is like, I would be reading for you and then, you know, there'd be a quick glimpse of something, maybe standing behind you, or I would see something and then I'd have to quickly try to figure out what I, what that was. Um, something, the script or descriptive that would help you know that I was talking to that person. So one example is I was reading for somebody and I literally was like, I don't know who you are. And he showed me a barbershop comb. So oh. I said, I think the person was a barber. And the person went, oh my God, I think it's this. So now I don't see it like that. And if I do get stuff, I'm seeing it in my head. So I get information in three basic ways. I see it, hear it, and feel it. So seeing is clairvoyance, hearing is clear audience, and feeling is clairsentience. So whatever I see, hear, and feel, I then translate back to the client so that they understand that I'm, um, this, is my, this is what I'm getting. And when you said you don't see it anymore, was that a conscious effort on your part not to see, or it just was something? It evolved. Yeah, it, it evolved. I think that when you when you start developing something, if we're talking about, let's say, I use a, like a lot of gym analogies. If you start lifting, you might you might not be able to you know curl forty pound dumbbells. You might have to curl ten pound dumbbells. But the more you work at it, the more you work at your you know your form the more you do it, you're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then you're going to go for the, the heavier weight. You don't see the 10 pounders anymore. You're looking at the 40. So mm -hmm. I think that the more I developed, the more my abilities got stronger, it became more of that three-part process rather than I just see something. When you realized you have this ability, did it, did it scare you at first? Mm -hmm. no. no, you can't, you can't be afraid of something you don't believe in. So that's the, that's the place that I started out. I, I was not a believer in the subject matter. My dad was a New York City police officer. He was a career military guy. He was not fond of the subject matter. He made fun of my, my mom and my grandma 
for like doing psychic stuff like he would from a young age let me know like their little you know <laughs> when it came to you know all of this like he'd roll his eyes and although I was not as close to my dad as I was my mom it did make me kind of it did make me kind of like laugh because I would like listen to their stories and I'd be like okay like hold on you went to a person and they're flipping over plastic playing cards and they're predicting your future and you're listening, you know, like it just, it doesn't, it, it sounds like ludicrous, but then when you see like anything, when you see validation in something, mm -hmm. I think that's when you start to shift. So at the age of 15, when a woman did this reading for me, and by the way, I went to debunk her, she had such a gravitas to the way that she delivered information and the way that she came across was confident and like, I'm going to own you basically, but without like saying that, you know, like that was the energy she had. And I just remember sitting there like, yeah, like, well, you know, I'm not going to help her. Like everybody else helps her. And the stuff that she came out with wasn't, it was not generic stuff. You know, and I say this often, like mm -hmm. she would have had to have been with me to know what she knew. And some of it was general and I could apply to other people, but most of it was not. And one of the major things that she started off the reading with was the reason why she agreed to actually come to my grandmother's house that day was to put me on my path. So it, it was just, it was wow. a very weird, yeah, it was a, you're 15 years old, you're a sophomore in high, in high school, and it's like, not what you're thinking, you know? So that was, that was my journey. So anything that happened from that didn't come from a place of fear. It came from a place of, I'm an arrogant 15 year old kid who's gonna prove this one wrong. <laughs> And now look at your career all these years later, which an ability you Crazy. were able to harness into your occupation. Right, which which was not my goal. <laughs> like right. my goal, my background is in healthcare and public administration. I was a few credits short of a master's degree in that field. I had only dropped out of the accelerated program because my mom died. And then I went to work into the workforce. I started at a hospital as a phlebotomist. I went into materials management. Then I moved into the information technology department. I was on fast track for, you know, the, the administration of a hospital. Um, and that was going to be my career because like I'm born and raised Italian. Like you, you make sure you take care of your family. Like there's no, like, you know, it, it just wasn't professional. So, you know, I was supposed to go for the 401k and the two weeks vacation and like do all of the, ha like all of that was real, mm -hmm. but this was my, this had been, become my passion. So for 15 years, I was already doing this professionally because I felt an obligation to do it. Like I had this ability, I knew I could help people, but this was never gonna be my job. And quite honestly, I'm not a patient person. So like my grandmother who I live with would get really upset with me because a client would come in, we'd go into the back room of her, you know, Long Island house. They'd be in there for like five minutes. They would like be walking out and she would look at me and go, but you couldn't have read them in five minutes. They were only in there for like, like what happened? And I'd be like, I don't like their energy. She's like, what do you mean you don't like their energy? I was like, listen, I have to choose to do this for someone. I go, I don't need to do this for someone. I said, so if I'm not really feeling them, I'll just say to them, like, listen, I don't think I'm the right person for you. You're not gonna have a great session. I think you need to, you know, go to somebody else. Here's five other people you can look after. And mm -hmm. then she would look at me and say, but you're gonna have no business. I'm like, it's not a business for me. Passion, mm -hmm. there's a difference. So that, that was my journey. That's interesting that you said about the energy, because I think I'm seeing more, uh, maybe more memes on Instagram about protecting your energy, protecting yourself, learning the power yep. of no. And for you to have that voice so early on to say, you know what, I don't like the energy. Um, that's empathic of you. You obviously have this ability to read others. So how does somebody, I would say, utilize and also contain that because I know when I meet people, I get a very strong sense of if they're having a bad day. And I find myself right. almost changing my behaviors to accommodate their seemingly bad mood or stress mood or anxiety. And I'm like, why am I being so like empathetic towards someone that's just giving me my groceries? <laughs> right. So I think that we could be human we could be we could be empathetic humans yes it's a good thing I, it's yes, a good thing it's, I, I, I think it's empathy not. yeah <laughs> empathy is very important in the world that we're living in because it's very divisive and it's kind of crazy yes. um but i think it's important it's important to be empathetic but i also feel like don't be entitled don't act entitled 
and your circumstances doesn't give you the right to be entitled over somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. So like I, uh, very real experience, somebody that I worked with at the hospital asked me, because I always had a waiting list. My waiting list was always very extensive. Or there was TV and radio. It was just a by word of mouth waiting list. And this person had had some huge tragedy and two separate people that knew him that I knew at the hospital came to me and said, can I do a reading for them? Long story short, he had lost a child. And I don't know this yet. I don't know anything about him. I sit and do the reading. And let me just say that not only did he lose a child, but in some respect, he would have felt responsible for how the child passed. So I completely got it. I completely got it. It was a very hard reading to do. I still, to this day, 25 years later, have the image of what I had to see in the reading, which was very, very hard. And I'm so happy that it was over the phone because my facial expression would have not been positive for him and his grief because it was just, it was that hard. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, he was appreciative. He was thankful. He was gracious. The gratitude, you know, I know I helped him. And then he said, when would you suggest I do this again? And I said, well, quite honestly, I go, now that I've read for you, I said, by the way, this was a favor. I said, so I would say, you know, I can't do this again for you. And plus, I'm not going to forget your story because it was too big. Um, but there were other people who do what I do. But please wait at least a year before you go back because you want to have time to heal and grieve and grow. So when your daughter comes through again, she could pick up and talk about where you're at. So as you're moving forward in your life, every so many years you want to do this, there's different check-in points. And you'll see that she'll talk about what's coming up. I did my job. A year later to the day. I walk into my office, um, which at the time was a side bedroom that somebody was yeah, making phone calls out of, to be quite honest. And um, I hear her kind of like arguing with someone on the phone. And I looked at her and I said, Joe, what's going on? So she put the guy on hold and she's like, this guy's harassing me. She tells me the whole thing. And I'm like, what's going on? She goes, he says, he's insisting that you promised him a year ago that you would read him again. Oh. And I was like, but well, you know, I don't make those promises. and I would never do that. And she goes, no, I know that. So I get on the phone with him recognize who he was because I told you I wasn't going to forget his story because it's that big of a story mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, I said to him we'll just call him Joe and I said Joe I said you know I did it as a favor I said and more importantly I said you know there's so many people that are in the same spot that you're in mm -hmm. that I haven't been able to help yet I go don't you want another parent to have the same experience and he said um, I don't give a flying f about anybody else I just want to talk to my daughter and you said that you were going to do that and you better be doing it again. So here I now had to say, sir, with all due respect, your grief does not yield entitlement. And I am so sorry for your tragedy, but I'm not the right person for you. And yeah. now I have to put you on a no, like a no fly zone list. Like, so I think having boundaries mm -hmm. is really important. And boundaries to me is like the foundation about uh, protecting your energy. Right. So you have to be able to know that you can say no. And the place that you need to say no mostly to are the people that you're closest to, not the people that are out in the world. It's your family members and friends because they feel that they're entitled to your time and energy and they may not be respectful of your time and energy. So you have to set those boundaries. And it's not easy. And people will think that you're being, you know, the B word or you're being difficult yeah. or whatever. Yeah, no, that's uh, boundaries are boundaries are difficult. That's a uh, that's a whole thing. And then um, talking about just energy, and you mentioned about that that man's grief. Um, I could only imagine what that was like for him to live through and to continue living while he lost his child. Um, we have survived, and I use that that term survived um, pretty loosely. We have survived a pandemic that has. Yep ripped through families, has taken away family members, loved ones. Um, and and our, our society, our world was grieving, is grieving still. And I saw a little bit of a talk that you did online about some tools and mechanisms that people can use in order to cope with loss and mourning. And I was hoping you could share some of those with us today. So first of dealing with COVID, I backtrack a little bit to about 2018 to 2019, I started and I say at every event, at every event, every city, state and country that I toured in, I kept making sure that people knew that nobody passed alone. And I thought that the reason why I needed to make sure that people knew that nobody passed alone was because we live in this like technology society and we're so busy, everybody's on their devices until COVID hit. And when COVID hit and it became very clear that people were passing alone in ICUs and on ventilators and families couldn't say goodbye, 
it added to as what one grief counselor named Milet Israeli that's out of New York's called it complicated grief. So now we're not just grieving, but the grief is complicated and it's complicated on so many different levels. So what I always want people to know, and if anybody's been touched by that type of loss where you can't communicate with a person and whether you're communicating with a person physiologically that's alive, right? Who then gets COVID and you can't communicate with, or if somebody's lost a child or somebody miscarried or whatever the case may be where we can't communicate because the consciousness isn't there, a pet, where a pet can't have verbal communication with you, nobody passes alone. And I say that not just from a medium standpoint, I say it from working in the hospital, right? It's when my two worlds kind of blended together. Being a phlebotomist put me into a patient's room and often. So I saw them multiple times during the day. And what I would feel is that there would be people standing around the head of the bed. And anytime I had that feeling psychically that there would be these like spirits around the head of the bed, I would think, are those their like guides? And then I realized it wasn't their guides. It was their family members and friends coming for them. And every time I saw that, that patient passed. So it showed me that people come for us. But I also know that in doing readings that people come for us. So I want people to know that when we're basically leaving this plane of consciousness, we are met by family members and friends. I use the analogy of, of birth, right? Uh, a baby's in womb for nine months, taken care of and nurtured, goes through a tunnel, sees a light, greeted by family and friends, waiting to love them. And that's the same thing that happens when we're getting ready to cross over. We literally leave this physical world and we're greeted by family and friends. But what we're leaving behind our family as well that now need the ability to, 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 to cope. And the way that we cope through that is with communication and honoring what we feel, F-E-E-L, as opposed to what we fear, F-E-A-R. And the fear can sometimes become a blockage and our grief also becomes like a fog that rolls in and we miss the ability to honor what we're feeling. So ways of, of dealing with it, creating journals, writing down your feelings, writing letters to a person and recognizing that we have to be 50% of the equation when someone leaves the physical world. And it's great to go to the cemetery and drop flowers. It's great to you know um, look at, at photos and, and talk about things to memorialize, but that needs to be more, in my opinion, active. We have to be active in our grief. I'm a big advocate for going to a counselor and working with a therapist or a grief group online or finding the right person. And by the way, I am not a big proponent for running to get a reading when someone passes. Mm -hmm. I would rather you wait to go for a reading until you're in a position where you no longer need one. Anybody who thinks that they need a reading doesn't need a reading. They need a therapist. So if you want a reading to connect to see if you can make a connection or who will who come through, but you got to be in the right spot to do that. So you're right. I think that people sometimes think they'll find solace in a reading, but when you're going through the initial trauma of grief, which has many stages to it, you recommend it's best that someone see a therapist and seek yes. crisis counseling. Yes, 100%. I had a woman call me, oh, this is probably again, probably about 25, 30 years ago. And I answered my office number and she said, um, I, I lost my mom and I need to talk to her. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I go, first of all, when you're going to go see a medium, don't give them information. You want to protect the integrity of the experience to make sure that the medium's giving you information based upon what's coming through. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I need to see you this weekend. I go, well, I can't see you this weekend. I said, I'm booked about almost a year in advance. She goes, I will give you $5,000 if you see me this weekend. Now, I'm probably all of about 22 years old at this time. And $5,000 to a 22-year-old back in like 1990, whatever, was a lot of money, you know? Yeah. And I literally said, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you're choosing me to be that person, but I hope you hear me. If you make this offer to another medium, they're going to take you up on it. You're going to spend $5,000. I said, you're going to be done with that session and your mom's still going to be gone and you're still going to be grieving and you're going to be out $5,000 that you probably don't have. I said, so please, please, please be very, very careful because mediumship is not a cure for grief. It could be therapeutic and it could be helpful, but it's not like the panacea because the reality is you want the person back and we have to learn how to, how to cope without them here physically and how do we include them in, in, in our lives? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important thing. Keep them present, keep them alive, keep the people like you have a child, anybody in your family that's passed, you want that child to know who they are connected to and you want to almost give an energetic holographic understanding of their personality and who they were and what they meant like i think my mom did an amazing job for me like i feel like i knew my grandfather and i never met him oh 
Yeah, that's yeah. Keep the legacy alive and and stories and pictures. And I do think yep. that's so important to honor those who pass, but also know that they live on through you, whether you don't you believe yep. in a heaven or an afterlife or you don't, that um that everyone's life is with purpose. And I is that some way to to grieve, um, to know that everyone's life had purpose? I think so. I think that it's also important to recognize that if someone doesn't think that they had purpose or if somebody thinks like this person passed so young they were so much they didn't accomplish i then try to turn that around and say well their life and their legacy of even passing young has a ripple effect and that ripple effect is going to alter and shift anybody the lives that they've touched so their accomplishment is ongoing hmm. no i i i love that that uh, because it, it's hard to wrap your head around tragedy. It really is, especially yeah. when it's been a, a life cut too short. It's it's hard to understand the rhyme and the reason. And I think it's greater yep. than all of us. Um, but to know that there's a constant ripple effect in our in our families, in our communities, um, in our universe. Thank you for taking your time. I know you're super super busy. Oh, um, no worries. Thank you for having me on. But it was it was lovely to connect with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll talk soon. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, I appreciate it.